there any relevance of native speaker norms? That's a question for temporologists. Is it better to focus on form or to focus on forms? That's a question for temporologists. If you use a textbook, is your classroom authentic? Or should your approach be more learner-centric? Feedback to learner autonomy. We'll discuss it all on Tephalology. Hi, Matthew. I'm Rob. And I'm Matt. And welcome back to the Tephalology Podcast, a podcast all about teaching English as a foreign language and related matters, presented by three self-certified Tephalologists. Okay, so today's episode is another one of those uh, footloose and fancy-free episodes where we, um, we've done it a couple of times before, haven't we? Done it once. Done it once. Yeah. Where, um, you refuse to let us call it a dog episode, <laughs> it's but not, that's what it's it not. is. Uh, basically, what, what happens is, um, unlike our other episodes where we plan um, extensively for each uh, segment, uh, today we've just brought a list of kind of questions or some thoughts that we've been having recently. And um, yeah, we're just going to kind of uh, talk through those uh, topics and see where it leads us today. Mm -hmm. So Matt, over to you for the first... No, Matthew, you're Matthew, aren't you? Mm -hmm. You're Matthew. <laughs> <I'm, laughs> um, over to you. My density you. crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Who am I? Um, Rob? What? Yeah. Um, okay. uh, over to you. Okay, uh, so the thing I'd like to discuss today is, um, I guess it's not really teacher identity, because I think mm -hmm. what I'd like to focus on is just what I'd maybe refer to as classroom persona. Mm. If that makes mm. sense. Okay. So uh, sort of who you are the, or the, the persona that you want to project in the classroom. And I think there's a lot of different ways we could go with this. But the way the sort of question I thought of or the way I thought of framing it is um, how much um, overlap is there, do you think, between your classroom persona and your non-classroom persona? Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, is, is there a difference? Is there, is there a difference? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, is, is there a... I mean, with myself, I'm not sure if, if there is a, a massive difference between what I'm like in class and out of class. Okay. Are you saying that there's a, there's a different type well, of... Well, that's, that's the question. Like, how, is, is there a difference? How much of a difference is there? Well, hmm. I, I wonder if you can say that you, are, that you have a unitary identity outside of class. If, we're, if, we're, if we would take, for oh, example, yeah, yeah, Goffman, the dramaturgical thing, you know, you're, you're playing different roles in different parts of your life of to different right, audiences, right? right, right. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think there's, there's obviously some overlap. There's always going to be some overlap because mm -hmm. you can't completely section off different areas of your personality. Yeah. Um, but you probably do tailor... Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. What you the the parts of yourself that you show to that particular audience, like you do to every other audience in your life. Mm. Mm, yeah. So I think part of it is maybe the obviously the the type of interactions you have with people. So you have different interactions with your friends, your family, strangers, etc. Mm -hmm. And um, when you're interacting with your students, is there, yeah, maybe well, I guess a certain you know persona that you want to get across. Um, that you think may be beneficial pedagogically. Mm, mm. Um, I guess another area to look at is the sort of information about yourself that you're willing to reveal or to, to share with your students. Mm. So I guess the image that I want to project to my students mm. um, is, I guess to some extent, being... We talked about it a little bit when we discussed uh, fun, right? Mm. Um, to some extent, being a serious teacher. Like I... I kind of don't like my students still treating me as you know the the genki foreigner in the classroom mm -hmm. um so i do i do make things fun but i also like to to a degree show off when i know something you know okay. um, or like give the impression that i'm perhaps uh you know more knowledgeable than i am mm. um or whatever i i like to um yeah to to try and cultivate a bit of a, a serious persona in the classroom but you know i still kind of keep things fun i actually got the um the feedback for my courses a few mm. days ago. Um, and the students said, you know, they, they commented on it being fun. Mm. So, yeah, who knows? Maybe I'm failing. <laughs> yeah, I guess maybe I'm, I'm aware of maybe preconceptions of us as, as teachers. Um, and maybe I think that plays on how I act in class. But <laughs> I can't exactly pinpoint what they are exactly. Do you mean specifically as... Um Maybe, or in yeah, English maybe as, yeah, as, as, Japan, a, as an English or? teacher and then yeah. as a foreign English teacher and then, and then maybe as uh -huh. a university English teacher. Mm. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I, I feel that maybe the students have they bring certain uh, ideals to class, and mm-hmm. yeah, maybe I'm. I don't know if I'm trying to disrupt those or agree with those, or I, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't think I'm doing anything too outwardly different, mm-hmm. really. But I am aware of them. Yeah. Do you reveal much about your personal life, for example? Um, not. Um, not without invitation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I don't invite okay. it either. Yeah. Uh, like I don't know. Like I, if a student asks me, I'm happy to share mm-hmm. information with them. But yeah. I don't want to just be a teacher where that just I just talk about myself a lot because yeah. uh, mm. there's a lot of teachers like that that I've noticed. Mm. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, I I bring in elements of my personal life as part of my teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So yeah. like I'll I'll use it as examples for students. Um. Things like that. Mm. Um. I think there are some people who are very very cautious about revealing anything about themselves. I'm not really sure yeah. why yeah. in that case. Like some people, you know, they, they don't want their students to know if they're married or have families or things like that. Mm. Um, and I don't really get that. Yeah. Um, or like about your, you know, your hobbies or your interests. So I'm quite open with my students about my hobbies and interests and things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that that humanizes me a bit in the classroom. Mm-hmm. Um, but given my hobbies and interests, it also probably detracts from that <laughs> serious image I'm trying to cultivate. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, when, when you say you, you're happy to share those, is it a case of sort of planning? Is that... Are you, are you planning to do that, or is it just if it comes up, if students ask you? If it comes up, like not necessarily if students ask me, but yeah. you know, again, if it's an example that I'm using in the class, mm. yeah, to like mm. explain a concept or something, then think, you know, it's the easiest uh, thing to reach to, I guess. Yeah. Okay. I yeah, I always feel like the start of term where people are getting to know each other. Um, they actually don't really get to know much about me. Mm. I think it's a very overlooked kind of part of my teaching. Yeah, I kind of I don't really inv- encourage it enough. I always say at the beginning of every year, okay, this year I'm going to tr- experiment with being a bit more personable and talking about myself. No, I'm not just talking about myself, but mm. injecting a bit more of myself into mm. the class. But um, I, I never do. I don't. What, think, why do you think that would be a good thing? I I always I I feel like the the older I've got, and I'm not that old, but I've over the years I've been teaching, I've got less and less personable with the students Mm -hmm. and maybe that's just the context that I've I've moved between the different jobs that I've moved between well we used to teach together and I remember you you used to make fun of me for being very distant with the students yeah 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 I was a lot more I mean I was younger then but I was a lot more kind of open and talking about my life and you know Facebook was kind of very big in Japan in those Mm. days so there was that kind of overlap I think maybe yeah how about you um Maybe similar in that uh, if they ask me, I'm happy to share things. Mm. And um, I think, yeah, I, you know, I like to, you know, um, you know, I don't want the students to not be looking forward to coming to class. I want them to, to be in a, an environment where they're sort of relaxed and, and, and open to learning. Mm. So every so often I'll, yeah, you know, maybe mention something about an interest of mine uh, and, and maybe use humor also. Mm. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. not not excessively but just occasionally you know partly to keep them on their toes see if they're listening mm. that sort of thing um, but I don't know may, maybe I've adopted a a uh, sort of an idea of focusing much more on the students getting to know each other mm. yeah. Um, yeah and so I often uh, you know get to the end of the semester and you know, students are saying, you know, at the end of the course and in certain, certain classes, the students really bond with each other and they get on really well. And, you know, you find out later they've become, you know, lifelong friends and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and occasionally, you know, you get classes where they want to take pictures with you as the teacher and stuff. Cause it's the, you know, you've gone through this thing together. Um, but also have classes where I feel like, you know, it's been a great class or a great course and, 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 you know, we, we had, we had a, you know, a meaningful time mm-hmm. together. Right. You know? Um, but the last class they'll leave and, and, you know, maybe, maybe a buy, maybe nothing. They'll just walk out the door. Yeah. Um, and I'm fine with that. Like, I don't, I don't, mm. I don't want them to think of me as friend. a friend necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like, I feel like there are other ways that I measure the success of the course. Mm. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to maintain ties with the students yeah. outside of class. I don't yeah. like them adding me on social media. No. I mean, I, um, I don't, I don't want yeah. like them. Yeah. Yeah, I used to, I don't let them anymore. For a, a few years ago, I used to allow them, but then put them directly on a restricted list so they couldn't see anything. Yeah. Um, but just, I felt like turning them down was a bit harsh, but now yeah. I just do that. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say, but at the same time, I, I, I wouldn't want them to not think that, you know, 
I, I'm, I'm happy if they think I'm a, a nice person or, or a person mm. they can <laughs> trust and, and are happy to spend time in the classroom with just because the opposite maybe might affect their learning, I mm. guess. And also I'm a, I'm a person, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, um, do you think that there's kind of an opposite end of this? Because I, mm. I know some teachers who almost, um, in a, well, in a completely scripted way, introduce aspects mm. of their life mm -hmm. to every class in the same way, as yeah. a way of managing the class or mm -hmm. as a way of, like, you know, it's like I'm introducing this element of my life now which I know I will be able to bring up again and again as a recurring joke to kind of build cohesion yep. to me that's actually not sharing anything about yourself mm -hmm. that's like uh -huh. you know making a caricature of some yeah, yeah it's not authentic essentially yeah yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah I mean I, if it works you know that, that's fine mm. and I sometimes I, I really go back and forth I sometimes think you know I'm aware of teachers who do really try to bond with their students on a, on a very sort of intimate level mm. I mean they'll not that intimate, but, you know, on, on a very personal level. Um, and will, you know, maintain relationships with, with their students outside of class or after the course finishes. And it seems very meaningful for both the students and the teacher. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think I would ever go that far as to, as to you know, trying to be friends or socialize with students. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, sometimes I do wonder if there are benefits, like learning benefits for the students to do that sort of thing. Yeah, probably. I guess what I was talking about was a little bit different. Um, the kind of the authentic sharing of an element of your life, like something, mm -hmm. like we said, that comes oh, up yeah. organically. Yeah. Yeah. Or the more artificial, mm -hmm. um, you know, selectively yes. choosing something yeah, yeah. in advance yeah. to yeah. share. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, so, I, I mean, there's, there's someone um, who I've seen who, who, who always talks about, you know, their particular, like, food preference. And then it comes up again and again and again as a, as a joke. And it, 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 it works. Like, the students really like it. But... Mm. Is like is that the kind of is that the same thing as actually sharing something about yourself, right? Or yes, is it cultivating part yeah, of your yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, just talking about like day to day teaching. When the students come into the room, um, I'm more like you said before. I'm more interested in them. I'm more well. I'd rather give them space to talk to each other rather than. Mm -hmm. I've got time at the beginning of class going up and making conversation. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd rather let them talk to each other and. But maybe then again, I should be a bit. I should. I've got this time. I could just go up and make conversation with the students. But um, yeah, don't know. I, I think I'm painting myself to be quite <laughs> not very friendly. But um, I don't know. I, I tend to just leave the students, let them speak together. You know? I think it, it very much depends on the context. If you're teaching in like university classes, then I do the same thing. You know, I I, I don't I don't make conversation with the students mm -hmm. unless they do with me. And I've yeah. I've had some students who are just about to graduate who. You know, they want to talk to me all the time. Mm. Um, and they get disappointed when I ask them to do group work and stuff because they just want to talk to me. Mm. Um, um, actually, I had a class recently who we finished the end of, you know, finished the whole course. And at the end of the final class, there were like five minutes left. And they said, Rob, can we, can we ask you <laughs> some qu about yourself? Because yeah. <laughs> I'd never said anything about yeah. it. So. Yeah. so I guess some students do want that. But mm -hmm. I don't know. It's not something I've got out of my way to promote. Yeah. 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 Another question I had is obviously our, our students see us teaching and in a different way to we see ourselves teaching. Mm -hmm. I, I guess like what on the topic of persona, like mm -hmm. what what kind of uh, what persona do you give off when you're teaching? Like what what? Like yeah. How do you think your <clears throat> students would would see you? I mean, like? in 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 course feedback, you know, students say things like you know nice and friendly mm -hmm. and but also helpful. And I think mm -hmm. helpful is the one I appreciate the most yeah. helpful yeah. yeah 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 i wonder i've always wondered that yeah mm. yeah what, what adjectives do you get well, i don't, I don't I'm, not, I'm not sure i can't i can't recall any adjectives but mm. um i don't know like, i mean what kind of adjectives would you like um well i guess the same kind of thing like helpful um yeah uh it, i i guess things less to do with character and more to do with things i actually did so like mm. it, again in my recent feedback i got quite a lot of comments that you know, when I didn't understand, he explained things in a way that I could understand, you know, or, mm -hmm. you know, he very kindly took mm -hmm. the time to explain things. It was that kind of thing. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that. Like, I had actually, I had one, some feedback for that where this, this particular student, I know the class it was, they were comparing me to a teacher they had in the first term. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were saying this teacher is, and they used three adjectives. Um, but Matt is, and one of the adjectives was mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what that okay. means. Like, yeah, but it was. Yeah. I think it was Probably a positive. Probably wanted to know more about. Yeah, you. I think yeah. so. It was yeah. a positive kind of. We don't really know much about him. And, yeah. Yeah, so. Okay, so that was the topic oh. of uh, teaching personas.
Okay, so for this section, I'd like to uh, lead a discussion about games in language, teaching, and learning, and a little bit of a backstory to, to why I chose this topic. Um, for our next episode, we're going to be releasing an interview with uh, two people who are kind of experts. They, they know much more about us, about uh, game-based language learning and teaching. Mm -hmm. And it kind of struck me that al although like games is a common term used in our, in our profession... I don't really know much about what goes into games or what, what constitutes being called a game and, and gaming in mm. language teaching and learning. Mm. So I thought today, kind of in preparation for our interview, I thought we'd kind of have a general kind of discussion about uh, games in, in language learning. Okay. So first of all, uh, what are both of your understandings of games in relation to language learning and teaching? And what kinds of games and or game elements have you used in your classes? Uh... Yeah, I mean, my first thought is maybe there's two different possible ways of approaching games. Okay. One of which is a, a game where the, the, the sort of topic or the subject of the game is language itself or the, you know, English language mm. or whatever language is being, is being studied. And another way, which is it just it's just a game that you could, anybody could be playing, but it's being done in the target language. Okay. That makes okay. sense. Right, right. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I don't think I used any any games at the moment or gamification. I don't include elements of competition in class. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the time when I most did it was with uh, kids. Um, yeah, yeah. But to be honest, like thinking about it now, it was it was mainly aimed at getting them to repeat certain phrases. Who can repeat the phrase the fastest or the most or whatever? So it wasn't really. I mean, I wasn't very good at teaching kids. Um, Mm -hmm. And I wasn't trained to teach kids, so the, I think the games didn't actually fulfill any kind of potential for language learning. Yeah. <laughs> at the time, they just kept the, the kids occupied, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I have. I mean, I don't. I haven't recently, but I have in the past used games. But they were, they were, they were more of the type where the sort of the, the subject of the game was to use the language. Mm -hmm. um, mm. So, like board games, like moving around and landing on squares and having yeah, to do something yeah, and that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, I was, I guess I was always surprised at how that, the, the competitive element, you know, students, even adult students would respond to that mm. and care about, you know, winning the game or not. Right. Um, but I don't know if that actually played a strong part in, in helping them develop their language skills. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's um, hard and soft games like mm. for example like there's games where they're actually a game it's introduced as a game mm -hmm. it looks like a game um, and then there's like more kind of the soft side where there's a there's a game element mm. and, that, and the more i think about our teaching like there's there's games of, of some there's some sort of competition in in every class is there i think so like you know like si simple information gap fill it, it, there's a there's a game element to that isn't there like you're you're trying to win something, you know. You could, I mean, you could easily add, yeah. add a... Yeah, we're trying to accomplish a task, I yeah. suppose. Yeah. Mm. But is, it, I mean, is a task a game? Like, mm. doing this is a task. Is it a game? Is it a game <laughs> to you, Matt? I don't know, yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I, I, I know that a lot of people include competition in their yeah. activities. Yeah. Um, I don't, and the reason I don't is because I'm a very... Uh, competitive person in the sense that mm -hmm. I'm not I don't I don't like competing because I'm an extremely sore loser because mm. um, I'm very competitive in that sense so like whenever I've been in a classroom and there's been a gamified element it's just made me go right I'm going to sit at the back mm -hmm. and not get involved I'm going to prefiguratively lose this yeah um, and I, I I know well I feel that some students would do the same thing but I mean do there do there need to be others for it to be a game can you not just kind of well, no, I mean, obviously, a computer game you do by yourself often, um, but then you're still playing against AI or whatever. Yeah. yeah I, don't know. <clears throat> I, mean, I guess the part that makes it a game is, I don't know, I mean, maybe we have to sort of go back and decide what is a game. Is there... We are, so I'm wondering is, yeah, I think some people would regard it as being more of a digital-based thing. Okay. And then obviously there's kind of more kind of... Um, yeah. What's the term? Board games. Yeah, board games, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then there's kind of like small kind of activities you can do in class that have, have a game element to it. So mm -hmm. I, I think it kind of covers all of it, I think. I guess what, sure. what is a game element, though? Yeah. <clears throat> Does that mean competition? Does that mean winners and losers? Yeah, I mean, it, there's yeah. Good, maybe a sense of playfulness. Um, That's extremely broad. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, then, I we're, we then we're talking about play in the classroom, not right. games. But d so so with a game, I wonder: does there need to be competition? Does there need to be some kind of completion? 
or winning. Mm. I don't think that necessarily has to be completion, or but yeah. I think that there has to be at least some kind of competition. Otherwise, it's it's not a game. Mm. What is it then? If it's <laughs> I don't know an activity. I know, just okay. Thinking more broadly about video games, uh-huh. um, are they always competitive, like games? I guess the comp. The competitive side is, is winning or losing. Like, you either win the game or you don't win the game. Yeah. Mm. You're not necessarily competing against <clears throat> another person, but you are, yeah. you know, competing right. to do something. Right. Yeah. To get and I guess you could view, like, you know, you either complete the task or you don't mm-hmm. as a game, but I'm mm. not sure. Mm. Like, mm. I wonder to what extent, like, testing. When I do tests in class, there's a, there's a game element to that, you know. The, uh-huh. like, um, the students are competing against each other. Are they? <laughs> I think they are. Okay. I'm what not, I'm not trying that? to make them compete against each other, but I get a sense that students are, they always check with their partners. and you know, yeah. I, mean, I guess, I guess there, there is an it's aspect where... It's a broader where, game, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, people know, can, like, can turn things into games that aren't necessarily intended as games. Mm, yeah. 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 They yeah. gamify the non-game. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this was another question I had as well. Um, yeah, is it gamification or gamification? Because I've heard Ga- people game- say. I think it's gamification. Yeah, gamification. I've only ever heard gamification. It's spelled gamification, but it's pronounced gamification. So, what, what, what does it mean, and why do you think this is becoming a common term in our field? Because I'm seeing it more yeah. and more. And I mean, well, I think one part of it is what, I, what I've seen more and more is. I, I think we talked about it in, in, a, in a relatively recent podcast, uh, like the. What is it? The escape rooms. Mm. There's a, there a language mm. school in the States yeah. doing escape yeah. rooms, but in the target language. Mm-hmm. So I think that's another, I think, you know, just different ways of, of organizing courses, saying this, organi- this course is going to be organized around us playing this particular board games. You know, mm. board games are quite popular now. People spend a lot of time playing them. Yeah, yeah. And as, as, you know, just being aware of the elements involved in playing board games, going through rules, repetition... Um, and this may be well suited for language practice. So gamification, is, is it the process of adding a game element to something that traditionally doesn't have a gaming element? Is that, is that that's yeah. how I understand it? I would imagine it, so, yeah. 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 But I, I wonder if what's happening is gamification, if, if, you're, if you're gamifying something that isn't a game, or if you're workifying a thing that what that is a game <laughs> if you see what I mean yeah. like the, so I discussed this in the interview um, with Xu Ming Tang at um, uh, Pansig yeah. Um, yeah. that we released um, I, I raised the question of whether like the fact that something is work you know it's, it's a game it masquerades as a game yeah. but it is work mm. right that is that just puts people off because of the nature of it being work or being study. Okay. Like if you ever played those educational games when you were a kid, mm. like they weren't necessarily worse than the other games, but you were like, oh, an educational game. Well, I don't want to play that because it's an educational game. It doesn't yeah. matter what the quality yeah, of it yeah. is, right? Okay, so then how do you define work? Mm. Yeah. So I, you know, a, 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 a case where, um, like like the escape rooms or like a course where you're, we're just we're going to do this thing, but we're going to do it in the target language mm. and. You know, I guess some language support will be provided mm. yeah. to to help you through. But so, if so the focus is on playing this game or getting out of the escape room, yeah. So there's um, an element of cha- like we said competition, but maybe yeah. challenge is a is probably a better word for mm. to describe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe going back to what you said at the very start, you said there's two types of game. There's one where the the language is. Right, the game is about the language. About the language, yeah, and then yeah. one where you're just, it's using, just the medium. using the yeah, language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I've seen a lot. I mean, I don't know much about this, but I've seen a lot of people using. Um, is it Second Life? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And those kind of open world um, yeah. platforms for mm-hmm. for language learning. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you think about that kind of uh, thing? How do, how do they use it for language learning? Without reading any studies, I'm not sure, but right. I think it's more. Well, I mean, I, I imagine people are kind of discussing how it might be used by learners okay. and mm. that, kind of, right. that kind of thing. I think something like Second Life, is that's just like an open, open world, open world sort yeah. of like a yeah. virtual social network kind of thing, mm. right? Mm. Mm. Um, but, you know, I'm sure there, there's probably lots of people around the world who have improved their English just by, you know, playing video games, online video games mm. with, with, you know... Yeah. Big groups of English speakers. The same as any form of media, people who improve their English through books, obviously, yeah. movies, yeah, yeah. subtitles, things like that. Yeah. So, um, so the uh, the two people we'll be interviewing next week, um, in one of the emails to us, they they mentioned that um, s- academic studies around um game based learning tend to be tech driven rather than pedagogically driven. 
yeah. um, exploratory rather than longitudinal, and digital rather than focusing on all varieties. So, mm. so what, what are your responses to this? What do you think? So the first point, um, I, I, I've been to presentations at conferences where someone's talking about using a game um, to teach things to students, but it seems to me that it's just they are, they are into that thing. They're uh -huh. into that game. They're yeah. into the technology. I think I, I see this a lot with calls, to be honest. Like yeah. people, it's more that someone's into the technology and less that they've got, like they've found a, an angle where they can talk about this technology in terms of the classroom, yeah. but it's really more that it's just they like it. Yeah. I remember year, like maybe 10 years ago, uh, my cousin, who has a very, very brief background in, in language teaching, um, but he, he thought, you know, he, his idea was, you know, they have these places where you can go and play like uh, Dungeons and Dragons and those mm. sorts of games. And he thought just combine that with a, with a language school. Mm. So like the, the mm. you know, in, in Tokyo, the Japanese kids who were doing that anyway, yeah. just say, okay, you're going to do it, but you're going to do it in English and you mm. know, with somebody who has the right skills to support you to do that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think with the right, the right people, it would work. Yeah. 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 What do you think, exploratory rather than longitudinal? I guess that means to the type of studies being done, um, uh -huh. that they're mm -hmm. looking more at the uh, maybe one-off experiences and how, uh -huh. not that I think there's anything wrong with that actually, but um, how learners are experiencing a particular game in a particular context mm. rather than how it's being used kind of over the time. Yeah, I guess longitudinal, it, it depends what type of game you're using. Like, mm -hmm. it'd be really interesting to, if, if you're talking about those open world kind of games, mm. if you track someone's language development over two years of them yeah. daily yeah. going in there and spending an hour, you know, doing whatever, mm. that'd be quite interesting. You could examine elements of their language production. Yeah. Yeah. And all varieties. So I guess we kind of said that um, it's not just about video games, like mm. games, more broad things, uh -huh. as far as I can tell. Yeah. yeah. Um, just to wrap up, what, what are you hoping to learn from our interview? Uh, we're going to be recording it in two weeks' time, and it will mm. actually be our next episode we release. But what, what yeah. are you looking forward to kind of finding out? Yeah, I think, I mean, just from the very, very sort of brief looks that I've had at, at you know, the, the stuff that the, those two guys are doing, and, and it, it, seems, it seems like a, a whole new world of stuff mm. that would be hard or, you know, take a long time to sort of get into. So... I'm hoping just to you know maybe learn some some entry points or some entry points. Yeah, yeah. 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 How, I guess how could it be integrated into um, more kind of formal educational contexts? Yeah. That would be interesting. Yeah. Um, and also, what is a game? I'd like to know. <laughs> what their definition of a game is? Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I'm hoping to find out more about what it means to be pedagogically driven. Like, how can you how can you make a game? with that in mind rather than the actual game itself being at the forefront yep. Mm, yep. Like, so that seems the hardest kind of challenge I think yep. so I'm interested mm -hmm. to find that out um, okay so uh, that's the end of this section uh, games in language teaching and learning for this section I'd like to talk about uh, something maybe related to your topic Matt um, uh, Matthew, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's who you are, I, I'm led to believe. Yeah. Um, so for this section, I'd like to talk about a topic maybe related to your topic, Matthew. Um, I'd like to talk about our insecurities as teachers. Mm. What do we feel that we're not very good at um, or not very trained in or you know, we l let our students down regarding mm. in the classroom okay. or out of the classroom, I yep. guess. Yeah, so um, I'll, you know, over to you. <laughs> <laughs> um. One thing I often feel like I, I, one way I let down my students is in terms of feedback. Mm. And I think it's, it's also connected to this idea of um, like individual learner differences. Mm -hmm. So I, I always have this idea in my head and I, you know, and I talk about it and I, and I, you know, when I'm talking to teachers that I'm overseeing sort of, you know, say to them, this is, you know, the sort of progression that you might want to make is distinguishing, you know, if you're teaching one course to a bunch of class, a uh, bunch of different groups of students, distinguishing between those, those groups of students. And then within those, you get to a point with it, within those classes, you start to be being able to distinguish different students' needs and that sort of thing. Mm. Um, I'm aware that I don't, I think I, I often don't do that. <laughs> like, I, you know, in, in a class, I'm not thinking about, okay, this student, you know, needs this, this student needs this. Um, I, I maybe treat the class as a group of students rather than a, 
you know, a bunch of individuals. Mm. And I think that often manifests itself in the feedback I give. Right. Where I don't, you know, I, you know if, if you're giving feedback on a piece of writing or something that's different, but maybe in-class feedback. Um, and again, I, I don't know how feasible it is or, or what I should be aiming for exactly. Mm. But I, yeah, I think that I, I'd, I'd like to give more specific individual feedback to students. Mm. I guess to an extent you're uh, restricted by, you know, your, the, the class size and sure, you know, the, kind, the kinds of opportunities you have to give feedback and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, even when I, even teaching smaller classes, and, and to be honest, even, you know, I, I mentioned about writing, it's, it's easier, but even then I often maybe get to the end of the course or, you're, you know, you're marking however many essays in a short period of time. Mm. And you think maybe if I was, if I organized my time better or, or if I knew what I was looking for better, then I could give better feedback. Right, right, right. Yeah. Do you think that that's something that you want to improve or that... Anything like that? Yeah, I think so. Mm. And, and Do you have any plans? <laughs> <laughs> no. Right. No. Um, I think, you know, partly it comes with experience. Mm -hmm. um, and partly it comes with, yeah, maybe or organization, you know, giving yourself enough time to do it properly. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I, guess I, I think um, in terms of feedback, I, I have very large classes, like 50 plus students sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, you know, it's impossible to give the, f the kind of feedback they want. What I normally do is um, I make space in my schedule. In the, like, if we do a test, mm. the week after the test, I make space in the schedule and I say, if you want individual feedback, you know, come and see me. Mm. Um, yeah, I'll be there right. for these hours. And then, and you know, of the fifty-something students, like four will come. Yeah. Um, and you think, well, okay, but you wanted the feedback, you yeah, know, yeah. and and you've got it, and like I can go through their test scores and give them, mm. you know, proper detailed feedback. Um, but then, you know, you never know, did the other students not come because they didn't want to or because they were scared or because they were busy or you, you don't know. Yep, so, yep. yeah, it's difficult. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, so insecurities. Yeah, a lot of my insecurities come from, um, like, feedback as well. And, like, mm -hmm. especially with writing classes, how much feedback to give. Because mm. um, a part of me wants to give good feedback, but I, don't, I also don't want to spend too much time marking either. Mm. But then maybe I should be marking more to provide. You 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 said you said the term letting down students. Mm. I I kind of feel sometimes I'm not doing enough marking. Right. I'm doing it very quickly. Mm -hmm. But then again, when I do say to students, if you want individualized feedback, I, I'll I'll provide that. They don't they don't ask for it either. So mm. then I, I kind of think, well, do I need to be offering more? What kind of feedback do they want? You know. It's, but um, yeah, I wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have the same kind of thing. I was I was thinking about um, assessment. Mm -hmm. um, I I feel that like for me, the I, I hate tests and I hate testing, and I think they don't really have that much of a place in in my classes. I I do them because I have to, because I have to assign a grade. Mm. Um, but I think that because I put a low priority on them, I sometimes underestimate the priority the students put on them, which is obviously very yeah, high. Yeah. Mm. Um, and so, you know, the students will get very worked up about the test. And I'll be like, what, 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 you, <laughs> what are you stressed about? <laughs> yeah. This is fine. Um, yeah, and I, I feel that, I'm, yeah, I sometimes don't put as much work into those as I should. Um, I think I'm focused too much on my own priorities rather than the students in that case. Mm. Mm -hmm. In terms of, you said letting the students down, um, I have some really good, when I'm in teaching, mm. like reflecting in action, I guess it's called, I have some really good ideas. And I yeah. think, okay, I'm going to go away and work on that. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the time I don't. I think that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's a hard thing to do, to, to notice something when you're teaching yep. and to act upon it like for maybe later classes or mm -hmm. later in that class even. Yep. I think it's quite hard to do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I had a teaching assistant for... Um, she was my student in a course um, and then she uh, became a graduate student and then she was my teaching assistant for the same course for two years running. Mm -hmm. And I remember in the um, in the third year, uh, like sort of the second year that she was my teaching assistant, um, there was a, a typo in one of the worksheets, and I said to the student, like the students pointed it out to me, and I said, oh yeah, thanks for pointing that, out. I'll I'll fix that. Um, and after the class, she said, you know, you said that to me when I was a student. <laughs> <laughs> you right. still haven't yeah. fixed it. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So I, I think I think you're right. Like it, it's very easy to spot things at the time and think oh, that's that's a, a thing I'll capitalize. But there's very easy to not do it but that's what yeah that's one thing correcting mistakes and also like ideas just general ideas and mm. okay for next year i'll do that differently and 
yeah, I need to have I need to get a better way of kind of um, yeah. holding myself accountable mm. for that for that long term stuff. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's, yeah, you know, for within between classes, I you know, always writing stuff down that, that I don't want to forget. Mm-hmm. But that's sort of on a week by week basis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. And I, I, yeah. you know, yeah. for a while I had like a different color ink for stuff to go yeah. in a, a long term to do list, and then mm. but it just doesn't happen. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's similar to conferences, right? You always go to conferences and you go, oh, I got a really good idea from that presentation yeah. and I will forget it within four hours. And, yeah. You know. yeah. Well, yeah. what's your, how do you feel you're letting down your students? Well, as, I mean, I'm talking about insecurities particularly. I don't, I, I think letting down probably the assessment is the, the main point there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think my main insecurity, which which does manifest in letting down students to some extent, is, yeah. um, is a lack of grammar knowledge. Oh, I don't oh. know. Um, I've got extremely poor grammar knowledge and I used to have much better grammar knowledge before I got shoved into teaching mainly skill courses where you don't really have to do grammar mm-hmm. but like you know occasionally a student will ask can you explain this grammar point to me and I say no right like, you know <laughs> I'll go and look it up and I'll try and help you but like yeah yeah you know yeah. no I can't off the top of my head I can't I feel really bad about that like you're meant to be a subject specialist to some degree uh-huh. um and you know, I, I'm I'm not. I think I'm not a lang- I'm not a specialist on language. Okay. Um, I think that's probably true for a lot of teachers. Yeah, probably, yeah. probably. I don't know. I spent I spent a lot. You know, the first ten years or so of my teaching career, mainly teaching uh, course books that focused on grammar. Mm, right. Uh, and got into that, but it, but it's funny because, like you said, having like switched to mainly teaching skills courses. Uh, I don't know, like six months ago, a student asked me a grammar question and. Mm. and yeah, I, I was stumped. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think like I, I never had those those years of tea. I, I taught at um, a language school for mm. 18 months yep. um, where we included, you know, we taught grammar points. And I, I started learning the grammar then. Yeah. Um, and then we taught the course together. We devised a course together where we yeah. had grammar points um, for two years. But then, you know, that was, what, seven years ago now? Um, you know, seven and a half, nearly eight years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, and all that grammar knowledge pretty much has, has gone. Mm. Um, but then, you know, I don't know. Do we need it if, if we're not teaching it? Yeah, know. maybe not. I think, like, insecurities goes back to what you think other, maybe other teachers are doing better mm. than you, perhaps. Yeah. What, what do you think they are? What do you, <laughs> what do you think other teachers do differently or, or maybe... What do Everything. You think? <laughs> <laughs> maybe going back to your point, what sort of persona do you, mm. do you want of other teachers mm. in your own teaching? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I worry about being seen as, like, like I said before, uh, about being seen as not serious. Um, and I think not being able to answer grammar questions maybe plays into that. Because, mm-hmm. um, you know, you're seen as the foreign guy who just, you know, that's your, your first language and you're not, you're not an expert. Um, and that's true to an extent because it's not my area. Like, I'm, I'm an expert on other things, which, which I'm going to move into teaching in a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Um, which will be good because then I'll actually be teaching something I'm an expert at, mm-hmm. apart from you know not language. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's 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 difficult, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm working in a faculty that's not my field, I guess, not my main interest. So uh-huh. I'm trying. So that's one of my insecurities, trying to act like I know. And I've I've done a bit of reading around that area, but I'm not I'm not an expert, and mm. I don't think the students think I am either. Right. But maybe they yeah. do. Maybe they don't. I don't know. I've never really worked. I should ask, really, to be honest. Mm. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. It's tricky. I, you know, I mean, one advantage of, of, of teaching for a while is that you become aware, you become more and more aware of, of, you know, well, I get maybe another way to answer is, you know, there's, I don't think there's that many things that other teachers are doing that, that are so great, you know, compared to what I'm doing. Like, mm. you become aware that teachers, you know, by and large, we, we often, we all do this very similar things, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. And like sometimes I'm jealous of teachers who do find, you know, an area like games or, or something that they, that they really get into and then they can focus their pedagogy around. And maybe it makes things a lot clearer for them when they're designing courses and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think in terms of, in terms of a lot of things, you know, Obviously, teaching a course for the first time mm-hmm. is going to be different. You know, mm-hmm. teachers who've been teaching it for longer maybe have a better idea. Mm. I think um, conferences, people, you only see certain people once a year. And uh-huh. they, maybe they talk up what they're doing throughout. Sure. I always kind yeah. of think, like, what what have I been doing throughout? I, you go to these conferences and people talk about what they've been doing th- throughout the year, basically. Mm. Yeah. I think they maybe talk up what they've been, uh, what yeah. they've been doing, maybe. 
when I started a blog for like a month, um, I wrote a blog post called "Where Are All the Failures," um, and it was it was about it was you know I'd been to a few conferences and it was just everyone saying, "Yeah, I did this and it was brilliant and it worked and it was great," yeah. um, and I wanted to share like H- here's where my lesson went wrong. Here's the thing I tried that didn't work out, yeah. and a few people picked up on that. And there were a few other blogs written by people like yeah, explaining yeah. their failures, and I think that would actually be quite good as a profession to sort of get a bit of humility, humility, humidity, humility. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, you know, where people are, are, are a bit more open, perhaps, about... I, I think people are quite open with their colleagues and stuff, but in terms yeah. of, like, when you go to a professional place or if you read a professional magazine or something, mm. it's it's all about the successes that other people have had or the brilliant ideas that other people have had. And I think it'd be quite nice, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, quite validating mm. to realise that everyone's making mistakes and, you know, messing things up as well. I w- you know, again... To, the last time I discussed my Japanese language classes, last time I did one of these episodes, um, I was thinking the other day, one of the teachers had clearly not prepared for the class, like, at all, and I thought, uh-huh. this is really validating. This is, like, <laughs> you know, it's fine, it's fine. You can tell that, you know, the teacher's kind of winging it. Yeah. Um, and I thought, yeah, but it's fine, and I don't mind. Yeah, yeah. And maybe when I'm doing this a little bit, the students don't mind. And maybe they know, but they don't mind, because it's still all right, you know? Yeah, yeah. Do you think that should be a conference theme? Fa- just failure. Failure. Just yeah. Like well, there is my my ELT MA supervisor. <laughs> um, he was. I, I'm not sure where it originally came from, but he was. He he really liked the idea of of te- teachers telling their students failure stories. Mm. And he had a he had, he had a few like examples that had been recorded of of other teachers that he had uh, supervised, mm. just you know basically telling a story to their students about how they failed. But there's also do you know about I can't, I can't remember what they're called exactly. Um, I don't remember the term, but something like like cup nights or <laughs> something like that, and it's basically like get-togethers. It's kind of like the Pecha Kucha thing. It's it's sort of yeah. informal, you know, in a, of an evening people go and get together, mm. but everybody stands up and tells a story about how they really screwed something up. Right. Yeah. Oh, I, I, yeah, I, I'd like that. Right. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't mean like that what you did w- was a bad thing to do. It mm-hmm. could mean you did it badly. You know. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think that's what kind of what I wanted this segment to be because we, you know, we we talk quite positively. I think about ourselves on the podcast. So what we should yep. now do is go to a conference and present this as our, yeah. our new idea. Uh-huh. Yeah, ELT oh, challenge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, this is a brilliant <laughs> idea. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't think it'll work out. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, from uh, from one failure to two others, um, I think <laughs> we'll have to draw that segment to a close. So um, that's been our teaching insecurities. So thank you very much for listening, as always. Uh, if you'd like to get in contact with us, you can send an email to teflology at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter at teflology, where we uh, tweet, I guess. Um, on Facebook, uh, we have a Facebook page, which you can like and uh, comment and ask us questions. Um, uh, we also have a book, Podcasting and Professional Development, a guide for English language teachers, available at Amazon and that might be that it. Is it. <laughs> and uh, for for our next episode, we'll be we'll be doing an interview with uh, James York and Jonathan Dehan mm-hmm. um, about game based language, game based language teaching and learning. So stay tuned for that. Yeah. And, um, well, stay tuned. Keep waiting well, for the next episode. Don't reach. Come back. Come back for that. I guess. Or, yeah. Yeah. Up, yeah, yeah. Update your podcast stream. Yeah. Speaking of failure, this outro. <laughs> so, that, so it's a goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Goodbye.